This nugget is the first of two in the series on project cost management. This nugget is focused on the first two elements, estimating the project costs and determining the project budget. The first of these, estimating the project costs, determines the costs for the individual elements of the project. All of the materials, all of the equipment, all of the human resources, basically taking each and every element of the work breakdown structure that we've discussed in previous nuggets and determining the cost associated with that. The next is determining the budget. Basically this is summing the individual costs together into a budget for the project. Putting the project budget on a timeline determining cash forecasts, cash flows for the project, putting all of the cost, all of the budget information together in a consolidated fashion that matches your corporate requirements for budget management. As with most of our other nuggets, the first segment deals with the planning activities for cost management. The next nugget will focus on the control activities for cost management. In this series on cost management, like many of the others, we've had a renaming of the processes. Originally, these were called cost estimating, cost budgeting, and cost control. As I've said in the past, all that's happened in these particular areas is the PMBOK guide has renamed all of the processes to make them verb phrases. You'll see in the nugget the original modules developed and the intent of cost management is exactly the same in this release as it was in the previous. Simply the names have been redeveloped to make them follow a consistent format. The first step in developing your project budget is cost estimating. Determining the cost to deliver each and every element of the work breakdown structure. The cost for each and every element of the breakdown structure can consist of a team. How much does the team member cost? How many hours is the team member committed to the work breakdown structure will determine the cost for the team. There may be specific materials related to each breakdown structure element. How many materials, how much do the materials cost will allow you to allocate a cost to each element of the work breakdown structure. And similarly for the supplies. Knowing what the supplies are related to each element of the work breakdown structure will allow you to determine the specific costs related to that work breakdown structure element. An important consideration when doing life cycle or estimating is determining the life cycle cost. Life cycle cost involves examining the trade-off of spending more now to spend less later. i.e. if your project involves an element of analysis and design, the widely held belief, and I'm one of those who hold this widely held belief, is if you spend more time, more money during the analysis and design phases, that you're doing a better job of defining the requirements and defining how the requirements will be satisfied will result in significant less spending in the development phase when you actually develop the right thing right the first time as opposed to getting into enhanced levels of testing or enhanced levels of rework. So as part of developing the overall cost estimate, you need to understand the cost for the team, for the human aspect, for the materials and the supplies required to allow you to complete each and every element of the work breakdown structure, but you also need to get into the trade-off analysis and determine does it make more sense to increase the spending in analysis and design to have a more complete, ro more robust analysis and design document so that the development will require less testing and less rework and less refitting to ensure that we finally meet the overall project requirements. As you're developing your detailed cost estimates for each component of the work breakdown structure, you need to be aware of what cost elements exist. You need to be aware of direct costs versus di indirect costs and which costs are appropriate for your project. Direct costs when dealing with a project team member 
would be the direct salary cost for the team member. For every hour, every day, the team member works on the project, your company is paying them so much in direct salary. But team members will also have indirect costs. It may be the fringe benefits. It may be their insurance premiums. It may be the space allocated for their desk. It may be the charges from the telephone company for their phone. It may be other costs directly related to the employee, but not considered to be direct costs. So as you're developing the cost elements for your project, what are the appropriate costs that the project needs to bear? What are the appropriate costs that should be included into the project? Do you only care about direct costs for your team, salary costs, or should you be factoring in other indirect costs, such as fringe benefits, telephone, desk, computer network access, and so on? The same considerations apply for non-team member costs as well. If you need to buy materials, if you need to buy a specific piece of material for your project, the direct cost would be the cost paid to your supplier for the material. But what about the indirect costs? What about the time for the purchasing agent to go out and negotiate a deal? What about the transportation costs to receive the material? What about the storage costs and the receiving costs to receive the material into your organization and potentially store it for a period of time until it's used by your project? So again, you need to consider what costs should be incurred, should be borne, should be addressed by your project. Just the absolute direct costs associated with the team, the materials and the supplies, or maybe some allocation for the indirect costs for, again, the team, the materials, and the supplies. Another consideration when you're working on cost elements are fixed costs versus variable cost. A fixed cost it is going to cost you a unit to have a certain X. That may be a resource, that may be a material, that may be equipment available to your project. So if you need to buy a computer server, if you need to buy a piece of equipment, to allow your project to continue, that's a fixed cost. It doesn't matter whether your project uses it once, uses it a hundred times, uses it every day for the project, you paid the single fixed cost to acquire the product and the cost doesn't change depending on the usage. Other project costs are going to be variable costs. For every unit used, there will be a direct cost or for that matter an indirect cost. For every hour of a team member on the project, there will be costs. For every piece of material bought, there will be a cost. For every supply used, there will be a cost. So again, as you're working on the cost elements, you need to ensure that you're dealing with the appropriate mix of direct and indirect costs, and that's going to be based on your overall corporate accounting strategy, and that you're dealing with the appropriate costs. The variable costs are typically the ones that are most easily identified and most easily included in the work breakdown structure element because the variable costs are directly related to the level of work with each and every unit of the work breakdown structure. The fixed costs are often harder to define, harder to find when developing your cost schedule for your project. You forget that you needed to buy the server. You forget that you needed to buy the piece of equipment and it simply disappears into the infrastructure. You must ensure that all fixed costs specifically acquired and allocated to your project are included in the overall cost calculations for your project. Another consideration you need to bring into play when you determine your project costs for each work breakdown structure element is the cost variability. How much control do you have over the cost changing over time? If you need to buy material throughout the duration of your project in month one, month two, month three, month four, how much control do you have over the cost for that material that it's not going to change over time? That it costs $1 in month one, it may cost $1.50 in month two, may cost $1.75 in month three, may go back to $1.50 in month four, and so on. What control do you have over the cost, i.e., what control do you have over the, inf the effect inflation or deflation is going to have on your project costs? A lot of materials will get expensive over time as a result of inflation. 
if you need to buy lumber, if you need to buy gasoline, if you need to buy most commodity products, over time inflation is going to increase the cost and gasoline in particular seems to inflate in cost at a great rate far higher than inflation. So how much control do you have over cost? Other components often will deflate in costs over time and technology being a prime example of that. If you need to buy technology, if your project is going to involve buying computers over the life cycle of your project with the cost curve for computing power, chances are buying computers later in the project life cycle will cost less than buying computers early in the life cycle simply because the cost curve for computing technology is continually going down, is continually favoring the buyer as opposed to the seller. What control do you have over volume? Do you have a contract in place with your suppliers that if you buy, buy between 0 and 100, it's going to cost $1. If you buy from 100 to 500, it's going to cost 75 cents. And if you buy over 500, it's going to cost 60 cents, for example. What control do you have over the cost variability? And more importantly, how do you factor cost variability into the specific costs that you're allocating to the specific elements in your work breakdown structure. Specific estimating techniques you may need to bring into play as you're developing your cost estimates for each work breakdown structure element. You may need to apply an analogous approach, i.e. the same as. The last time we did a task, the last time we completed a project element that was like this, it took us a certain dollar or certain time effort. You may be able to develop your estimates based on a unit cost based on effort, i.e. you have already gone through your detailed time analysis, you've already allocated specific work estimates to each and every unit of the work breakdown structure. Maybe your cost estimation is as simple as determining the unit cost, remember the direct cost and the appropriate indirect cost allocation, for each and every team assignment times the effort assigned in the work breakdown structure to come up with the cost for the task. Maybe you have some kind of parametric approach. For every unit there's a dollar and you measure the number of units and you get a value. You know how much it costs to produce a line of code you know how much it costs to produce a square foot of retail space. You know how much it costs to produce a unit of X. To complete your work breakdown structure, you believe you need to produce 300 lines of code. You multiply that by your parametric value. You know you need to develop 200 square feet of retail space. You multiply that by your parametric value and you come up with the cost for that specific work breakdown structure element. Or you may go out and actually solicit vendor bids, say, I am going to contract out this element of my work breakdown structure. I'm going to expect my vendor to give me a fixed price bid of how much they're going to charge me to complete this element of my work breakdown structure. There is no way, one right strategy for developing the estimate, the cost estimate, for each element of your work breakdown structure. The analogous may work well for some of your work breakdown structure elements. Others that are pure team member based, unit of effort by team member times cost, direct and indirect cost for the team member, will develop the cost for some components. Parametric will be appropriate in other instances, and vendor bids and fixed price quotations will be appropriate for other components of your work breakdown structure. So you may apply one, several of all of these estimating techniques to come up with the cost estimates for each WBS element. And that's what this component is dealing with, developing the cost estimate for each component of our WBS. The final step in project budget definition is to develop your actual project budget, or as the PMBOK defines, cost budgeting. The first and most obvious step is to aggregate the costs. Sum all of the costs for each of the elements of the work breakdown structure that you developed during the previous step will result in your project budget. 
When you're aggregating your costs, ensure you're including all costs. The easy and obvious ones to identify are the direct costs directly associated with the work breakdown structure, the direct variable costs, but ensure you're including all costs, the direct and the indirect. The fixed and the variable costs all must be included into the aggregation of the costs for the project. Once you have developed the aggregate costs for your project, you then need to develop a cash flow for the project. Larger projects, expensive projects, will require a very comprehensive cash flow statement for the project. Organizations don't want to have surprises. Cash flow management in organizations don't want to have surprises that all of a sudden there's a bill for X thousands of dollars or X hundreds of thousands of dollars in a month directly related to project costs. You simply can't say as a project manager that says, well, you knew my project was going to cost one and a quarter million dollars or whatever the case is going to be. You should have been prepared for this cash flow. You need to provide a month for month cash flow that in this month my project will require five. In the next month my project will require ten. In month three my project will require six. But in month four my project will require twenty-five or whatever the case is going to be. That allows the financial analyst, that allows the cash management people in your organization to have the appropriate reserves on hand so that when the bills start to flow in, when your project makes that large purchase, there are no surprises, the cash flow is available, and the organization is properly prepared to deal with the cash flow requirements for your project. It's not enough to simply say, oh, you knew this was an expensive project. You need to have detailed cash flow on a month by month by month basis to ensure cash management is properly controlled within your organization. Once you have the full cost budget in place, you need to develop a cost baseline. Here is the baseline against which all future measurement for my project will be done. When the project is approved and signed off, the cost baseline is $75,000 or whatever the case is going to be. That is the baseline, that is the measurement, that is the expectation that senior management and the business have for your project. Your project will be considered on budget if your project delivers at $75,000. Not at seventy-eight, not at eighty-two, but at $75,000. The baseline is a fixed number. The baseline is the number against which you are going to be measured. The only way your cost baseline can change is with approved changes. So if your baseline was $75,000 and you had to approve changes for another $5,000, your revised baseline, and it's only revised because approved changes, will be $80,000. That is the measurement, that's the yardstick, that's going to be used to overall measure, determine your project's health in terms of cash management. And finally, when you're developing your project budget line, you need to have a form of contingency. You need to have reserve. You need to have items in your hand to deal with the unknowns that's going to impact your project. It's wonderful to say, I've done all of the planning and I've determined a project baseline of $75,000. Or it's wonderful to say, I've done all my planning and improved changes and my cost baseline is $80,000. There will be unknown risks. There will be unknown activities that you simply can't identify during planning that need to be built into the overall project cost as well. So you need to allocate something for contingency. If the project's expectation is $75,000, you need to have a reserve. You need to have contingency. How big that reserve is going to be, how large that contingency needs to be, will be covered in a future nugget called risk management, but you need to be aware that you need to have some incremental value on that contingency to address the unknowns. So let's, let's assume going in we say there's going to be a 10% contingency. So that means our budget is in $75,000. It's $75,000 plus the contingency, and for round numbers I'm going to say 10% is an additional $8,000. So your total project budget 
is $83,000. And that's excluding change. Change would increment that ongoing as the project is delivering. So I'll throw your cost baseline. The item your project is going to be measured against should be the detailed project plan of $83,000. The project with contingency will actually be $83,000 to ensure you have some room to deal with the unknown, some room to deal with the risks, but the contingency needs to be managed separately from the cost baseline. It's not simply mad money that you can use randomly throughout your project. It's there to cover specific project risks. And finally, in terms of cost budgeting, you need to be aware of your level of precision. You'll notice when I've been quoting numbers, I've been quoting numbers rounded to the even $1,000. Although during your detailed cost estimating, your estimates are probably developed down to the dollar or even possibly down to the cent level, when you're preparing a cost budget, you need to round the numbers to the appropriate level. to the nearest thousand or possibly for very large projects it's to the nearest ten thousand or so on. If you develop a cost budget that says my total project budget is seventy five thousand dollars three hundred and twenty one dollars and nineteen cents no one is even going to look at the, the lower level numbers and it actually gives a false degree of impression that instead of being measured that your project delivers in the range of $75,000 or more appropriately in the range of $83,000, they're going to expect your project to deliver down to the dollars and cents. So you need to round your budget appropriately. You need to present the information at a level that management is going to expect to see it and that certainly round it at the thousands, tens thousands, or maybe even $100,000 level, depending on the size and magnitude of the project. A second related level, or item, is the degree of precision. Or another stated is your degree of confidence. Do I believe my budget is plus or minus 10%? i.e. this is a very detailed, focused budget. If you think back to when we were doing with time management, a rolling wave that I have detailed estimates for each and every element of my project, or is this a plus or minus 50% that this is an initial project budget? I only have detailed estimates for the next phases of my project, which is the first of five phases, and I have summary level estimates for the remaining phases of my project. So when you're presenting project budget information, make sure that you're presenting your precision level or the degree of confidence. Yes, I'm telling you my project is going to be $83,000, but that's plus or minus 50%. I'm not far enough into the project to be able to definitively tell you that the project is going to be $83,000. Every piece of information I have at hand right now tells me it's going to be $83,000 but there's a degree of confidence. I need more information. I need to be farther into my project to allow me to deliver a definitive statement for the project budget. One final consideration you may or may not need to be aware of when you're producing your project cost budget is the actual accounting processes, the processes that the accounting department will use when determining and validating and working with your project budget. And these can be reviewed in terms of things like present value, net present value, rate of return, payback period, future value, discounted cash flow, and so on. My recommendation is you need to work carefully with your finance department to understand the accounting principles they will apply. Will they be doing present value or future value? Do they need a discounted cash flow? And work very carefully with those financial analysts to ensure that you're applying the appropriate accounting treatment for your project. To apply these accounting treatments, you need to know expected rate of returns, rate of return. You need to know your company's expectations for inflation. You need to know your company's expectations for interest rates, and so on. 
So there's a lot of very specific information that your financial analysts in your organizations will have that you will need to flow into each and every one of these calculations that you may or may not need to do in terms of the accounting value or the accounting treatment for your project. I keep saying you may or may not need to do. If you're dealing with a short project that covers a six-month window, I would suggest, and I think I would be very accurate with this, you will need to apply none of these accounting principles because the difference between the present value of money now and the present value of six months hence is very much the same. There's limited application of inflation or interest rates on that money. But if you're dealing with a project that covers two, three, or four years, then there is all likelihood that you will need to work with your financial analysts to work through the present value of money to work through discounted cash flows because then your project will be very much impacted by inflation and interest. So again, my going in statement is work with your financial analyst, work with your accounting department to ensure you're applying the proper accounting handling of your budget and that you're presenting your detailed budget information in the format at the level expected by senior management. Having said all of that, those of you going forward with your PMP exam, you need to be very much aware of these terms. So what do these terms mean? Present value is applying an expectation of future interest rates to determine what the future value of, or sorry, what the present value of money is that would be reserved, received at some future point in time. So if your project is going to have a benefit statement of $15,000 in three years' time when it is implemented, what is that $15,000 worth in today's money, i.e. the present value, and that applies an expectation of what the interest could be earned, etc., etc. The opposite to present value is future value, and that would often be taken into account in project calculations as well, where future value is just the opposite. If I took the $5,000, $50,000 that my project needs to expend and put in the bank account and left it in the bank for the three years that my project is going to be using that money. How much money would my company have? What is the future value of the money? Is it a good investment to invest in my project? Or should the company be simply investing in the bank? What's the net present value? Is the present value of money minus the present value of the costs, i.e., what is the return on your project? If you take the full discounted future value of benefits minus the fuel, full discounted value of the cost for your project, what is the return? Again, is the company better off investing in your project, or is the money better off taking the funds from your project and putting in the bank and earning interest, which is equivalent to our rate of return? Is this a good investment decision for our company or not? And what is the payback period? Based on the costs, based on the benefits for the project, is this project going to pay for itself in six months, one year, two years, five years, and often the length of the payback period is going to be a large determination of whether, in fact, the, the company will want to invest in your project or not. So for those of you doing your PMP, you need to be aware of, and the key is you need to be aware of these financial management terms, what they are, and how they're applied to your project. You do not need to be a financial analyst. You do not need to have a degree in accounting. In fact, in most instances in the PMP exam, you do not even need to calculate any of these present value, future value, rate of return calculations. You simply need to be aware of what they are and how they're applied to a project situation. In a live project delivery situation, my recommendation is Work with your financial accountants, work with your cash management people to ensure you're doing the proper rate of return, that you're using the inflation factors that your company expects to see for the future, that you're applying the interest rates that your company expects to see, that the financial accounting principles applied to your project budget are consistent with your organizational policies and procedures as opposed to what you, a specific project manager, may feel is the proper information related to inflation and interest rates. This concludes the first of our two nuggets on project cost management. In this nugget we focused on the planning aspects of cost management. In that we estimated the project. We determined the costs for each WBS element. We considered the costs as either fixed costs 
or variable costs. We consider whether we were going to include the direct costs only or the direct and the indirect costs. Once we had the cost for everything related with each element in the WBS, we put that together and created the project budget. We talked about the financial principles. associated with proper budget management, making the budget for your project align with the financial management pa practices, the principles of your organization. We developed a project baseline against which the project was going to be measured for success and we talked about adding contingency into the project budget to allow for dealing for unknowns to leave our project equipped to deal with a bad things, unknowns that's going to happen, while st still delivering on budget. Our next nugget is going to focus on controlling the costs, the execution against the project plan, and managing to the budget. This concludes our nugget on project budget definition. I hope this video has been informative for you, and thank you very much for viewing.